I, uh, in preparing for this message, I, I suddenly realized why uh, there's an Easter bunny at Easter because uh, the, the events surrounding Easter and the resurrection after Easter, you, there's an opportunity to chase a lot of rabbits, if you ever heard that. So uh, I tried not to chase too many, but uh, I, I am somewhat of a rabbit chaser. And, uh, and if, you, if you take notes or if you mark in your Bibles, uh, there's some really interesting stuff that we're going to talk about today. Um, so I invite you to, to kind of get ready for that. But we're now two weeks past Easter Sunday, and last week we talked about Jesus' first in-person encounter following his resurrection with, um, when he met Mary Magdalene in the garden. And... Um, we talked about how we, she didn't recognize him then in, in part because she wasn't expecting to see him. Um, but once he called her name, once he said Mary, there was no mistake. Um, she was face to face with the resurrected living Jesus. And we talked about how she was actually the first person commissioned by Jesus to, to go and tell. You know, in, in Matthew 28, uh, we have that great commission. But actually, before he ever got to commissioning his disciples, he, he commissioned Mary to go and tell. He, he sent her to the disciples to tell them what and also to tell them who she had just experienced. So this morning, we're going to pick up that narrative uh, uh, just a few hours later after that encounter, possibly around noon on that first day of Jesus' resurrection. Um, and like I said, you'll remember that Jesus told Mary Magdalene to go and tell the disciples and Peter to meet him in Galilee. But, but first, Jesus has a couple of other stops to make. Um, and his first stop, <clears throat> excuse me, his, his first encounter out of the garden was to walk along with two people who were on their way home following all the events that had happened around the Passover. They've got a seven-mile walk between Jerusalem and their hometown, a place called Emmaus. Now, Luke is the only gospel writer who actually tells about this encounter. And uh, so we're going to look today at Luke chapter 24. The entire account is found from verses 13 to 35, but we're going to look um, and we're going to read specifically, we'll refer to some of the later passages later in the message, but we're going to look this morning, we're going to begin with verses 13 through 24. So uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 24, the gospel writer records this encounter. Now that same day, two of them, we're going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleophas, answered him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked, Jesus. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, <clears throat> but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. So is the reading of God's word. Join me in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather here. We, we thank you for your word that we have the chance to study it and apply it to our lives and to see how you impacted so many lives then that, that ripple through time to, to impact us today. Father, we just ask that not only our minds today, but our hearts would be open, that we would respond to what you are speaking to each of us about. And we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. 
You know, remember last week when we talked about the Mandela effect, um, how Nelson Mandela had been released from prison of various times uh, during the time leading up uh, until he was officially released from prison. And so they let him kind of get back into the swing and understanding because he had been out of society for so long. And uh, But the thing was, nobody recognized him, um, in part because they, the whole nation had been told for years that he had died in prison, which he hadn't. And they also didn't recognize him because they weren't looking for him. They didn't expect him to be there. And that applies in today's scripture also, but it's really only one small piece of the puzzle. Luke tells us that same day, two of them are going home. As I said, it's seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, but this encounter is not only a literal walk, but it's also a spiritual one wrapped up in a seven-mile journey. Luke tells us uh, something about, or this encounter tells us something about who we are. And it also tells us something about how Jesus opens our eyes to see him for who he is. And all of that is a process. So Luke says that they're talking with each other about everything that had happened. They're discussing everything that they had seen in the city over the past few days and how disappointed and sad they were that things had happened as they did. And then Jesus walks up. No introduction. Just this man who is now walking beside them. Now I'm guessing that these people weren't alone on the road that day uh, because many people would have made the trip to Jerusalem for the Passover. Um, like I said, it's only seven miles. So people, people from way away from Jerusalem would have saved, sometimes most of their lives would have saved money to be able to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So these people are only seven miles away. So a lot of those people would have come to, come to Jerusalem, would have come to the center of, of their faith to celebrate the, the, the highest um, festival, the highest observance that they had. I mean, how many of you on Monday drove to Versailles or some other location to see the solar eclipse in its totality, right? You could have stayed home and viewed it with more than 99% coverage, but to fully experience it, it was a, just a short distance away, so why wouldn't you do that? Like I said, many of you drove to Versailles or someplace a little farther north, but I'm guessing that very few of you would have driven to Texas to see it in totality. That'd just be too far away, but it's just for sales or it's just Milan or Greensburg or wherever, so it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Let's go see it, right? So being a short distance from the city of David, being a short distance from Jerusalem, it would have been common for many people in the immediate surrounding area to go to Jerusalem for the Passover. So I'm guessing if they all came to Jerusalem, they would be leaving Jerusalem somewhat the same time. So if, if this road is filled with walkers, if this road is filled with people who are not only going back to Emmaus, but are going back to all these other cities that lay, on the, uh, that lay past Emmaus, it really wouldn't have been that unusual or strange for someone to come up and walk beside this couple. They wouldn't have thought anything about it. And the new guy looks at him. He says, what are you talking about? Now, Luke does something here that can be overlooked, but I believe it's very important. Because I've made assumptions about this account in the past, but I'm open to the possibility that I've been wrong in the past. It's one of my rabbits. Ready? Verse 18. 
One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What are you guys talking about? Well, in a city full of people, are you the only one that doesn't know what happened? But in that statement, Luke identifies one of them. One of the people, it says, a man named Cleopas. So why not the other one? Why doesn't Luke identify the other man? Well, my guess is, is because the other one wasn't a man. And it would have been common Jewish practice back then that women would not have been identified. John chapter 19, you're flipping through your Bibles, John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. John records, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time, this disciple took her into his home. Verse 25 in John 19 tells us that one of the Marys, there were three of them, one of the Marys standing near the cross was the wife of Cleopas in the NIV. <clears throat> now, in Luke's account on the road to Emmaus, Cleopas is spelled C-L-E-O-P-A-S. Here in John, it's spelled C-L-O-P-A-S. In the King James Version, it's spelled C-L-E-O-P-H-A-S. I'm telling you, it's a big rabbit. Um, but there are biblical scholars that believe that this Mary's husband is the Cleopas that's walking back to Emmaus. So the other of them, if you look at the beginning of, verse, of our scripture this morning, it says... Two of them, right? It doesn't say two men. It says two of them in Luke 24, 13. So the other of them could have been Cleopas' wife, Mary. So many times we assume that it's two men, but Luke goes out of his way to not identifying them by gender. It would have been very easy in 2413 to say, later that same day, two men were walking back to Jerusalem, but he doesn't say that. He says, two of them. So, if it is Cleophas and his wife Mary walking back home, and Mary had been standing at a distance and had actually seen the crucifixion, that gives us quite a bit of insight into the nature of the discussion that the two of them were having as they walked. And again, it might give us some insight into their knowledge of what the women had reported about the tomb and why they didn't recognize him. Luke records that when Jesus asked them what they were talking about, they stopped walking. The grief and the anguish had overcome them. Again, are you the only person who's been in Jerusalem who doesn't know what happened? Cleophas asked the man. Jesus answers, well, what things are you talking about? What are you talking about? Now watch how Cleopas and Mary, because it says they answered, not he answered. How they answer the question beginning of verse 19. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. 
Now, stay with me for a minute, but watch this journey, okay? Journey in quotation marks. They begin their trip and they don't recognize him. But then they have an understanding about what the scripture says about him, right? He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, the chief priest uh, and before God and all the people. And the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped he was the Messiah. He was a prophet, both in what he said and what he did in front of God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over and sentenced him to death. And we had hoped that he was the one. On the road that day, the two had a preconceived idea about who Jesus was and what he had come to do and how he should do it. If you go all the way back to Palm Sunday, they were leading him into town because they thought he's going to establish an earthly kingdom and he's going to throw these guys out and we're gonna, he's going to take over and we're going to take over too. They had a notion about who Jesus was and what he, should, what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. They saw him as a prophet sent by God who had done all types of amazing and miraculous things. And because of those things, he had amassed this huge number of followers to the point that the civil government and the religious leaders together decided that he had to die. And they killed him in an awful, cruel way. We had hoped he was the one. Now, the pair goes on to say that they had also heard from the woman, from the women, who had been sent to the tomb earlier that morning. And the women had reported that there wasn't a body in the tomb and that they had seen a vision of angels. And in verse 24, it says, some of our companions went to the tomb and, just like the women said, found it empty. In Scripture, don't miss this, they say some of our women, not some women. And then it says some of our companions, your translation may use a different word. But some of our women went to the tomb and found it empty, and then some of our companions, after they came and reported to them, some of our companions went to the tomb, and just like the women said, they found it empty Watch, they did not see Jesus. So the fact that they used the term companions when, app when apparently speaking about Peter and John, because we talked about that, right? John records that he and Peter, after Mary Magdalene told them, he and Peter ran to the tomb, and John you know, made sure that he pointed out that he outran him, right? So these two people on the road to Emmaus, they are, they are most apparently speaking of Peter and John. And they use the word companions. And I, again, I believe that, that that tells us that these weren't just two, two random people walking along. I think we can conclude that they were, these were Jesus followers and that they were Jesus followers kind of in that inner circle. So why the downcast eyes and the long faces? Again, because I believe they had a preconceived idea about what Jesus was going to do. And when it didn't happen just as they thought it should, when things didn't turn out just as they had expected they would, they dismissed it as a failure. They thought they had misplaced their hope and their trust. We had hoped he was the one. And we do that too sometimes, don't we? When things in our lives don't go as we think they should, many times we blame God for not coming through for us, right? We see other people walk away from God because something happened that they didn't want to happen or something that 
didn't happen that they wanted to happen and, and they just fully couldn't fully understand it. It didn't happen exactly the way I wanted it to happen, therefore it's a failure. But here's the thing. Maybe instead of giving up, maybe instead we ought to consider the possibility that God is up to something that we don't fully understand. Right? It didn't happen the way I thought it should, but it really is probably happening the way God thinks it should. And that's where our faith comes in. So, verse 27 tells us that at that point, Jesus began to use the Hebrew Scriptures. And it says, beginning with Moses and the prophets, Jesus begins to explain to them what the Scriptures said about him. They just don't know he's talking about himself. Now, nowhere... We don't know what scriptures Jesus used. It's just like when he leans down and he writes in the dirt, there's all kinds of speculation about that, but they don't really know what he was writing. And here it says that he began with Moses and he went through all the scriptures and he explained to them about him. And we don't know what those scriptures were. But maybe, big maybe, he started with Deuteronomy 18.15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. And then maybe he went to Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. Isaiah 53, verse 3. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and, he, and we held him in low esteem. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, he did not open his mouth. And finally, Zechariah 12, 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one who mourns for an only child and grieve bitter, bitterly for him as one who grieves for a firstborn son. This is written hundreds of years before the guy standing on the road next to them tells them about it. It would have been, those scriptures would have been the core of everything they knew. So what's been going on? Are you the only one that's here that doesn't know about these things? What things? Well, there was this guy, Jesus, and he was a prophet. and He did all these amazing things. And the, the civil government and the religious leaders, they decided that they couldn't have him around anymore, so they had him killed. And, and we had hoped that he would be alive. And he isn't because the grave is empty. We really hoped he was the one. It says, Jesus goes, well, um, let me take you through the scriptures and let me explain something to you. And whatever scriptures Jesus did use, he walks them through his fulfillment of prophecy to show them how the Hebrew scriptures testified to who he was. It, they testified to why he came. And they testified to why it was all necessary that he come. Now watch, it's entirely possible that these two people agreed with everything that Jesus said. They just didn't recognize that Jesus was the one who said it. 
Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, Consequently, faith, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So where does our faith come from? Come, where does our faith come from? It comes from hearing the message about Christ, which is given to us through his word. Our faith doesn't come in seeing him. Our faith comes from believing what we hear about him. Hebrews 11.1, 1, a very famous passage, says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Simply put, their faith then and our faith now isn't built on seeing Jesus. It's built on believing in Jesus through his word. So we get this picture from Luke that Jesus is explaining these scriptures and the, tri the trio at that point arrive in Emmaus. Luke says that Jesus gives the appearance like he's going to walk on. But the other two tell him that it's getting late and that he should just come to their house and have supper and spend the night. And then he can resume his journey the next morning. Luke says they gather around the table to eat and in verse 30... It says that Jesus broke bread on the table and handed it to them. Verses 31 and 32 of Luke 24. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They didn't recognize him until he broke bread and handed it to him. And at that moment when they recognized him, he disappears. Where he ends up, we're going to talk about next week. So why don't they recognize him until he breaks that bread? Well, it's possible, possible, that these two people, Cleopas and Mary, assuming that Mary is the other one walking with Cleopas on the road, and, assume, and knowing that Mary was standing and watching the, the, the crucifixion, and them explaining to Jesus that, that our women went to the tomb and our companions went to the tomb after the women told him he wasn't there anymore. It's entirely possible that these two people could have been gathered with Jesus in the upper room to observe the Passover that night he was betrayed. We see the painting, and we assume it's Jesus and the Twelve, but there were other people in that room that night. He had other followers in that room that night, just not just those Twelve. And I think it's possible putting together all of those other clues found here, being at the cross and companions and all of that, <clears throat> that if it is possible that they were in that room that night, they would have seen Jesus pick up the bread and break it and say, this is my body which is broken for you. And that would give us some insight into why it was at that very moment they finally recognized Jesus. It's exactly what he did on the night he was betrayed. Like I said, Luke said at that very moment Jesus disappears from their sight. He's gone. And Luke records that they talk about the emotions that they both felt while Jesus was teaching them on the road that day. It says, were not our hearts burning within us? Emotions that caused them to get up even as night fell and head back to Jerusalem. Now one of the reasons they asked Jesus to stop that night and one of the reasons people didn't travel at night was that the road was filled with danger after it got dark. Read about the Good Samaritan. When darkness fell and people were traveling on the road, they made prime targets for thieves to jump out from behind bushes or whatever and rob them and beat them and sometimes kill them. So you didn't travel at night. They had just seen Jesus and we got to get back to Jerusalem and we got to tell them. <clears throat> 
So the danger of traveling at night doesn't deter them. Verse 33 says that they returned at once to Jerusalem. They didn't go, let's go to bed and get up in the morning and go. They said, let's go now. And once they got there, they found the 11 and all of those with them. Judas is out. Their story? It is true, it says, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Luke goes on to say that then the two told what had happened on the way. So you get this picture of the two of them finding those 11 in hiding and going in and going, it's true. It's true. He's alive. And here's our story. So these two disciples have been on a journey. One was a physical journey covering 14 miles, seven miles out, seven miles back. You're 14 miles from BB, Indiana. I can't get that out of my head. And the other was a spiritual journey that strengthened their faith. See, they didn't recognize Jesus. And then they began to understand what the scriptures said about him and what the scriptures prophesied about him. And after they heard about him through God's word, they believed, and then they recognized who he was. And once they recognized who he was, finally they gave witness about what they had seen and what they had experienced. And I think each of us travels that same road. We don't recognize when Jesus intersects our lives. We hear people we love and trust tell us that Jesus was a good man, that he was a great prophet, that he was a good teacher. They will tell us that Jesus is just one of many ways that a person can get to heaven. But Scripture, God's ordained word, tells us that our faith is strengthened when we believe what we hear and read above what we see and are told. Because people can tell you that Jesus was a good man, and he was. They will tell you that he was a great prophet, and you can make a case that he was. They will tell you that he is a good teacher, and he was. And then they will tell you he's just one of many ways that a person can use to get to heaven, and they're wrong. <clears throat> John 14 says, I am the way and the truth of life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. See, our fellowship with Jesus does not depend on our ability to see him. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Our fellowship with Jesus comes in our taking him at his word for who he says he was. And who he is today. See, I've said this before. Lots of people know about Jesus. They just don't know Jesus. A lot of people know about him. They just don't know him. And maybe that's you today. Because like I said, I believe we're all on this same journey. We don't recognize him. And then suddenly people begin to tell us things and we look at scripture and we look at other parts and we begin to see that, that he is the culmination of the story that has been centuries in the making and he gets here and at that moment we see him for who he is. And when we see him for who he is, we have no choice but to go tell other people what we've seen and what we've experienced. And maybe that's you today. 
Maybe for the very first time you're noticing the person who's been walking beside you and teaching you and helping you and loving you all this time. Maybe your heart is begging you to just stop learning about Jesus and just start beginning to actually know him. Because at some moment, Jesus is going to open your eyes. And when that happens, you can't help but have the desire to go and tell other people. So our question today is an easy one. If that is you today, if that is us today, what's holding you back? Let's pray. Father God, we love you. I thank you for this account. I, I thank you that, that you give us this picture, this account of, of these people who have, who have experienced you, who know all about you. But when you're standing right in front of them, when you're standing right next to them, when you're walking along beside them, they don't recognize you. In part because although they know about you, they aren't looking for you. Father, help us to see that, that, that your word found in Scripture in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, it's not just a bunch of stories and it's not just a bunch of rules that we're supposed to keep these and don't, don't do this and do that instead. And, but it's, it, it's a narrative that takes us through centuries and leads us to you. Father, we're also mindful that... that Seeing you isn't the end of the journey. It's in many ways just the beginning. So help us all to understand that we haven't missed it. We're not too old or too late. Help us to see, Father, that, that you want us to believe in you, not because we see you, but because... Everything you put in front of us leads us to that conclusion, and it's the only conclusion we can come to. That you weren't just a prophet, that you weren't just some nice guy, that you weren't some magician, you weren't just some healer. You were God's son sent to this earth to love us, but ultimately to die for us and then to overcome that death to give us the opportunity to do the very same thing. Father, if there's somebody in this room today who never really thought about that or who is thinking about it for the very first time, I ask that you just continue to open their hearts to break bread in front of them so that they would see you very clearly in their hearts and in their minds. Father, I ask that you place a boldness in our hearts to respond to whatever you're calling on each of us to do today. Father, we love you. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. And ask some, uh, Doug stand over here, uh, Richard's over there. Um, if uh, the Lord is speaking to your heart as we sing our hymn of invitation today, uh, if you need to pray, these guys are here to pray with you. I'll be down here. We have the prayer room over here is, is open all the time, and it's, uh, it's not just a really nice, pretty room. It's a place where you can go in and shut the door and just either by yourself or with somebody, just, just have that time with Jesus. However he's speaking to you today, we ask that you just respond to that. Let's all stand.